Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for one of the last sessions of the day for a session on food, farming, and funding. Uh, it's really exciting to be talking about regenerative finance along with regenerative agriculture here. Obviously, um, everyone's kind of on their own regenerative journey in some way, and I feel really privileged to be amongst a group of people that are so passionate about kind of this transition and this way of being, whether you're at the start or the end. But from my experience, I find that we're talking about the funding and the finance side a lot less, um, which is okay. Obviously, farming and food is the problem, but what we, what we believe is that a lot more money needs to flow into regenerative agriculture in order for it to become much more mainstream and large scale. So we want to bring that conversation to Groundswell. There's not that many people talking about the finance side. And when we started to prepare for this, I was determined to try and put statistics on here talking about how much funding there is going into food and farming in general and how little is going into regenerative. But there is basically no data on that. So if anybody has stats, please come talk to me because I'm very, very interested. We wanted to do something where we said, you know, look around this room. This is how much funding there is. One person is the amount going into regenerative, but actually it's probably even less than that considering, you know, how many people are in the audience and how much money is really out there. So anyways, um, just to briefly walk you through how the talk is going to look and then, yeah, we'll jump right in. So... Um, my name's Tessa. I work at an organization called Be the Earth. It's a foundation that does both philanthropy as well as impact investment, and we are focused primarily in food and farming. So we fund a lot of organizations, individuals, like people who are here, and we run a number of programs that support um, individuals and organizations as well. And yeah, these are founders or directors of two organizations that we have funded. And I will let everybody introduce themselves in a second, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk you through two case studies led by the amazing Kuhn, who can kick us off with the next introduction. Thank you so much, I'm Kuhn. I have the great pleasure to interview many people in this space of regenerative agriculture and food on the role of money. And so asking the question, what is the role of finance? What is the role of money as a tool? And as I think it is a very important tool, not the most important one, but definitely an important one. And we, I'm using the collective we here as a sector, uh, should definitely be better and get better at using the tool. There's a lot of money out there, maybe not the right type of money, we're gonna talk about that here as well, but there is a lot of money out there and it would be a shame of not putting some of that, um, let's say pulling down some of that and putting it to work in, uh, in the soil. And we have been doing interviews on that topic, about 250 and counting, um, from farmers to investors to funds to soil scientists, always asking that question. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and doing it live in a, in a shorter version uh, today and with an amazing panel. So thank you so much, first of all, for coming. The last uh, session before beer and snacks. Uh, so that's uh, an honor to have you all here. But I'm going to hand it over to you uh, for a brief introduction to my left. Hi, Tessie. Oh, yeah, that's working. Um, yeah, so I'm Ruth, um, Ruth Anslow, and I'm co-founder and co-MD of an, an organisation, a social enterprise called Hisby, Hisby Food, and my other co-founder and co-MD is over there, it's Jack. Um, and, um, yeah, Hisby is a, um, an alternative supermarket, a supermarket built for the real food and farming movement, and we're doing a case study on it, which I'll expand on. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for welcoming me. My name is, is that, yeah. My name is Mark Jones and I manage the uh, Wild Farming Company. Uh, Wild Farming is a regenerative agricultural company that uh, aims to scale the regenerative farming system developed by our co-founder Andy Cato. Um, Andy's speaking tomorrow uh, and so I'm reluctant to sort of butcher his incredible journey, especially as he might be in the room and that would be uh, particularly embarrassing. Um, but needless to say, Andy went on a journey about 15 years ago uh, that ended with him um, refining a system of farming that prioritizes um, soil health and biodiversity while sustaining a robust yielding um, arable crop. On the back of that journey, he founded two companies, Wild Farmed, our sister company, um, which I'll provide a bit of context on, is, is, is kind of 
it's an end-to-end -end supply chain that on one hand offers, or one end of that supply chain offers um, farmers who grow in a, in, a, in a system that is similar to Andy's, a premium offtake for what they grow. And on the other end, it offers um, uh, businesses, bakeries, cafes, Marks and Spencers now, a truly regenerative product. And wild farming is just one small part of that supply chain. We're taking the system that Andy developed and scaling it across the UK. Um, in doing so, we, we, we partner with progressive landowners um, and we also look to lease and invest in land ourselves. Um, and we will be a small part of that supply chain, but we hope an important one, um, helping to um, act as a lighthouse for other potential regenerative farmers, as well as driving innovation and uh, supporting their journey. Super, and we're gonna hear in a second, or in 15 minutes, uh, what the funding journey has been and why and how, but we're gonna start with, with you. Um, do you remember the moment you decided or needed to uh, attract outside funding? Because it's quite a decision to let other people literally, quote unquote, into your kitchen. Yeah. Um, also with money, there are interesting power dynamics there we were gonna get into, but like, do you remember that you and, or, or with your co-founder, okay, we, we need outside funding, is that? Yeah, um, it was the day we signed a 15 year lease on a shop um, in April 2013 and we only had about 80 quid in the bank. Um, because we believe in throwing your hat over a wall, you have to follow it. So yeah, uh, my sister and I <laughs> had been living in Brighton and working on a business plan for a, and a blueprint for a new kind of supermarket. Um, we called it HISBE because that stands for how it should be. Uh, this is one of our stores. Um, so not, and not your normal <laughs> super tiny... Yeah, it's, bigger it's, than, it's, it's always proper bigger supermarket. than people think, yeah. yeah. And the whole idea is to create a blueprint for a supermarket that works for regenerative food and farming. So um, it's mostly local suppliers, there's a big plastic-free section, there's a lot of sustainable and eco brands. We think very carefully about helping people reduce packaging. Um, and m probably most importantly, we give most of the money we get to our suppliers, which is a bit of a revolutionary concept in supermarkets. Um, and we um, invest most of our money in the local economy. So we're kind of reinventing supermarkets for the regenerative food and farming movement because it's really important to connect consumers and everyday shoppers with this stuff. So the whole point of this of HISB is to connect people, everyday shoppers, with some of the concepts that we know um, are important for the future of food um, uh, through um, the avenue that they know, which is a supermarket. So anyway, we signed a lease on a shop with no money in the bank, um, and we had to very quickly raise money. And also, we had spent three years building a crowd, a following of people that were interested in what we were doing. So it was a, a we'd, we talked to banks who weren't interested in lending two sisters with no trading experience a load of money to open a shop. Um, and it's so, a big surprise, <laughs> yeah. you know, surprise. So we went to crowdfunding for proof of concept. So we'd spent three years building uh, a crowd. We had to raise 200 grand to open the shop and kit it out to this standard. And um, it started with a blog and a crowdfund for 30 grand. And the rest came from there, from different sources. And do you remember, Tessa, when Hisby, still one of the best names there, but came, came on your path or came on your radar? Because these are things, especially funding, I mean, people that are in it know it takes forever. People that are not in it might underestimate that. Like, this is, a, um, this is something that takes a lot of time. It needs to fermentate. It needs to really, before it clicks and the money is wired. Do you remember more or less when they came on your radar, basically? Yeah, so Hisby has actually existed for much longer than Be The Earth has in its current form. Um, and we met Ruth and Jack almost two years ago when we were starting an accelerator program and they were post COVID, which obviously wasn't a nice time for supermarkets that, you know, have a storefront really. Um, I'm not going to butcher your story for you, but, um, they needed to find more funders basically. And they joined our program, which was absolutely amazing. The second I met both of them, I was like, you are it. You need to. You need to. You need to continue to exist. You know, there's so many amazing businesses out there that don't attract the right type of funders because there's so few funders like that. Um, so we came in much later in their journey, really, and we're still in the process of that funding journey with Hisby, actually. That's right. When we came to the accelerator, we, you know, it was ten years into our trading journey, and we'd raised well, about a million and a half along the way from different sources. But COVID 
well, the first year of COVID was a shit show. I'm sure it was for a lot of people. But yeah, it, it battered us. And we needed ex outside help to invest back into the business to grow out of that problem. So Be The Earth was the, the, the right people at the right time because not only were they offering investment, but they offered us an accelerator and mentorship uh, to help us get out of survival me a mindset and into um, growth mindset again. So Which means you're a second shop, basically. Yes. So, um, no, we already you're, uh, you're a chain. Yeah. yeah, we're a chain now. Well, Tesco started with one store and so did we. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I always say. So, yeah, we, um, we had to, s we'd survive COVID just, and um, we've been on an investment journey to get ourselves back to trading where we should be because customers after three years are only just coming back to shops like ours. And when you started a funding journey like that, what are the sources in, or what are the types of funding? The sources are different, but the types of funding you felt were possible or most close with and how did you end up and what kind of funding did you end up with with BD Earth? Well, we investigated lots of routes. We looked at VC funding where people, you know, they're dropping in a big amount of money to expand as quickly as possible and then draw money out within five years. They want to triple, quadruple, five oopal their <laughs> investment in five years. And, and I'm, I'm guessing that didn't fit your No, it growth. didn't fit because, you know, we've got a, a business that's based on delivering values and social values alongside money. And we can't do a return that quickly unless we hyper-franchise. And if we hyper-franchise, we lose the value. So we needed more patient capital, someone who got where we were coming from and understood the principles of regenerative farming and food and what we were doing. And um, so, yeah, we looked at um, the traditional routes and we looked at um, loans and we looked at selling shares in the business. But actually, what we needed was incubation. And I think that, that, that actually Be The Earth is kind of incubating us with that um, mentorship journey, with that acceleration journey. And then finally, they offered us match funding. So um, that's been a really good mechanic for us. It's a long-term loan that's convertible into shares. And we're now doing a big crowdfunder. Uh, what's long term in this case? Oh, so it's um, well, we it's over uh, up to seven years, um, but we don't pay anything for the first two years. And the idea is that we're um, raising the money we need to turn around the business in its current form to get us back to being scalable. So um, the mechanic that we're using is a crowdfunder. There's some funny. Uh, Sounds putting putting me off a bit. Sorry. Seems um, like a, a <laughs> cleaner going on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, we've gone back to crowdfunding. I mentioned that the first thing we did to raise money was crowdfunding. It's about going out to the public and saying, "This is a rallying cry for supermarkets. This is what we care about. This is what we stand for." And we've always been really good at rallying that crowd. So this this is live. This campaign. We'd love you all to have a look at it. Um, and to share it and see what we're up to. And every pound that we raise through this crowdfunding is being matched by, not only by Aviva in the crowdfunding mechanic, but by Be The Earth. So it's a really great way of raising the money that they will match. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. It's a, it's a big marketing campaign. The campaign page shows what we're doing with the uh, in the store, what our work looks like. And it's got customers and suppliers engaged again after a really weird three years where people went went away. So the crowdfunder is our is our way to unlock the funding from Be The Earth and, and it's a really good collaboration. You have something to say. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna add, in terms of the mechanics of the agreement, there's not actually a set or defined repayment point. So basically it's modeled, um, the repayment is based on revenue. So it's a percentage of revenue that you have to repay. So if revenue is below expectations, then it could take however many years. Mm. Basically the reason she said seven is because what we modeled was um, at seven years, that's when it's expected to be repaid if kind of they hit all the milestones mm -hmm. in their projections, um, which as I'm sure everybody knows is never the case. Sure, maybe you float above, you float below, but it's very, very unlikely that people actually do hit um, exactly what they're, what they're anticipating. So yeah, the, the model we, we put together is called revenue-based financing, which is meant to kind of incentivize... Um, alignment. Yeah, basically. alignment, really. And it's intended not to be extractive. So you know, as an investor, what's the point of 
investing in something and then continuing to extract from it because actually in the end if you extract so much there's going to be nothing there so it's meant to really as you said align interests so we're taking out but obviously you know be the earth is very privileged and that the first thing we're looking for is impact not profits and that's definitely not the case for every funder mm. yeah and just to add on that i think the revenue finance piece is is talked about a bit i wouldn't say even a lot but happens very very rarely and so we need a lot of innovation on the finance piece to to align investor and investee because often it's it's a very interesting power dynamic where the power lies with the investor and in this case actually you're in the same boat and um, so that's that's interesting how was that to do that then with the crowd or to to even because I see often the people like, ah, oh, revenue share is great, revenue, et cetera, and then they end up going anyway for a loan because it's simply easier and the accountant understands it and the notary, et cetera. Like how difficult was it to do a different type of funding inside, um, of course, a, a relatively traditional thing, which is a supermarket? It wasn't difficult. It was, you know, it was a, a deal and an agreement that was worked out with um, an organization that knew us really well by then. And they could see what we needed, which was patient capital. Um, and it was a very creative solution to what we needed. Um, and um, yeah, no, and, that, and once we had that commitment to match fund from them in this loan that would be released as we raised the money, um, it was easy. That's nice to hear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna make sure we have time for, for Mark as well, and we're gonna have time for a few questions uh, at the end. So I'm gonna, uh, thank you so much. This is way too short to, to capture the whole journey, but still it's a, it's a taste of, uh, of a very interesting funding journey, which takes years and, and a lot of, uh, I mean, it's ma you make it sound easy, for sure it wasn't, um, but come for for the, the let's say, the, the war stories. It's easier than some of the stuff we've been through recently. I can imagine, <laughs> yeah. But you'll be around also for questions yes, later. Yes, of course. So thank you so much. So Mark, for you, the same, when, first of all, you decided you, I'm, I'm using the general you around um, wild farming and wild farm to set up a specific almost development company, was it immediately clear you wanted to raise or you needed to raise finance or when did that moment happen say okay we need outside funding because as i said with Ruth, it's quite a, a commitment you let people into your kitchen people with money and different power dynamics was it clear from the beginning or do you remember when that happens because you come from the finance world like you're used to this language but this is a different beast um yes fundamentally from the beginning we knew that we would need to raise capital um and there were a couple of different reasons. So on the wild farming side, that is purely focused on, on, on the farming. Andy had moved over from France and had taken over a 300 hectare farm in Oxfordshire. Uh, and we had a contract farming agreement um, to manage uh, a farm just outside Peterborough. And so uh, we needed to raise money at that point to invest in infrastructure, farm equipment. So there was a bit of urgency and there at that was point quite a bit of urgency i mean yeah scary, often yeah. you feel like uh, a startup is is well building the plane as you're flying it and, it and it certainly felt like that we wanted to get seed in the ground we wanted to really start to to, to drive the farming operations forward um and so we need to go out raising money for for infrastructure for machinery um Farm machinery, it turns out, is quite expensive. Uh, I had heart palpitations as I saw Andy walk up and down all the sort of rows of machinery there, knowing what might come down the pipeline there. <laughs> um, light drive working capital, uh, seed, agronomy, um, and then operations as well. Um, financing operations and, um, and looking at sort of giving us runway to grow as well. It's a bit like signing a lease and then having to actually build a supermarket. A little bit, yeah. And then, but you don't want to miss the season. Like if your supermarket, you open a bit later and not, I wouldn't say not too much happened because, of course, your cash flow isn't that nice. But if you miss the season, you miss a year. Exactly. So then who do you call? Where do you start? What, what's the first step asking for some friends in the room? So if I guess if you looked at, uh, at what we needed, if you had three years of financial statements, um, if it was a sort of cookie cutter farming model, you know, machinery, um, working capital, you could go to financial lenders for that, banks, um, asset financing. But ultimately, we didn't have those things. We were uh, an early stage company, and moreover, we were an innovative company. So different yields, different inputs, uh, just very different to anything that any sort of lending institution will have seen before. And so that quickly became clear that, that we needed out equity. But you ultimately. tried. Did you we actually didn't try too much, no. It, I mean, I put my investor hat on and thought, would I lend this company money at the moment? 
had no idea what the working capital cycle looked like, had no idea what the cash flows would shed off to be able to repay it. We were quite confident, but, but you know, if you don't have three years of financials, it's, I can understand why they wouldn't lend. So at that point, we thought, okay, uh, we'll go out and ra we'll, we'll raise equity. And uh, additionally, some, um, uh, a small amount of flexible debt alongside that as well from Ecosia. Unfortunately, um, I was introduced to Tessa by, uh, I think, Robert Reed, who's in the crowd today. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the it, uh, well, Tessa can tell her side of the story then, but. Yeah, what do you remember from when did it get on your radar? Because this feels like a, a shorter journey almost, and it was need, an urgent need to get literally, like Mark said, seed in the ground. Like, do you feel that sense of urgency then when you have that first meeting, or is it really getting to know each other? and see if there's something to be financed, or how, how does that happen? I definitely think it was much longer than Mark would have hoped. <laughs> That's a general theme in investing, and inv investor, I investee. Accurate. <laughs> I think we met in December, and the investment closed just basically in the nick of time, in summer two years ago. Was yeah, exactly. Yeah, so as you said, we were introduced, and I mean, with Ruth, obviously, she hit the nail on the head and said we had built a relationship already, right? So we could move really, really quickly because there was already trust there. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of relationships, really knowing that the founder can do what they say that they're going to do and not wanting to step in and take over because that's simply not Because everything our sounds amazing in yeah. a PowerPoint and a spreadsheet, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So there was definitely a huge piece of understanding the business. We brought in to tons of people from outside. First, even just to know, is this you know new, regenerative way that Andy Cato is farming really good? Like, we don't know. I'm not a farmer myself. I can't make that judgment call. So we brought in other experts and had tons and tons of conversations. But also, we weren't the only funder. You know, we were one of many. And I think what Mark was alluding to is, part of the journey for us was also introducing other funders. So not saying, hey, we'll be the last ticket or we'll be one of, but actually we'll be one, but here's 10 others that we think you should talk to. And very happily, a lot of those people had amazing conversations and were really impressed by what they were creating. And actually, in some cases, we were able to have do shared due diligence, so assess the opportunity of wild farming together, have calls which ended up taking less time and also we understood what questions other investors had as well. So it really worked um, bringing other investors along on the same journey and the same timeline and reaching out to our network that we knew was interested in similar things. So that's definitely a key principle that we operate on at Be The Earth. We never like to be the only person in the room just because then people are always going to come back to us and also it just it's great to have different connections. You know, people bring more than just a paycheck. They bring connections, relationships. Um, so a lot of the other funders we brought are people that can add way more value than we can in many other ways. Yeah, and just full disclosure, we're par personally part of that small, a very small part of the funder group as well. And Mark, how does that work? Like, how many people do you talk to? Wh what's that dance or herding cats? Because he said it took longer than, or you said it took longer than expected. How do you make sure somehow it gets through the finish line? Maybe there's a bit of FOMO play in there as well. Like, how do you make sure you get the money on time on board? Because otherwise, y it's quite a, um, a hit or miss, let's say, in terms of year. Like, what's what's that process like? Very stressful. Um, but uh, as Tessa said, so I, I think the first thing to say is that when you think about going out and raising money, and whether you're raising equity or you know debt, there are different pools of capital out there um, that have different term times, that have uh, different return profiles, that are interested in, in, in a variety of different additional outcomes. Um, and if you start off and you have a good sense of, you know, what will the return profile be on this, do a little bit of rudimentary modeling, uh, build a bit of a pitch deck, and then go out and start to speak to investors, particularly in this regenerative space, particularly in the impact investing space, and even VC and actually all sorts of sort of commercial lending, they do want to crowd other investors in. They want to take other people on the journey with them. It shares their risk, it shares due diligence cost, um, and uh, we certainly saw that. Um, and then it's just about, I mean, really taking them on a journey. 
the, the sort of, I guess, uh, is the expression, you know, it's very difficult to invest in a single data point. You want to invest in, in a line of data points, see a, a company's growth, really drill into um, what they're trying to achieve, the journey that they've been on, the trajectory, that helps you set milestones in the future, understand if they say they're gonna achieve X and they do it, then you can follow on that in that round. Um, and we didn't necessarily have that relationship at the beginning, but over that sort of six to eight months time, we were able to build it with that group of investors and take them all on a, on, on a journey, take them down to the farm, understand what we were doing, meet Andy, drill down into the farming technique, look at the financial model, understand you know, at what yield this was viable, um, at, at what yield it was exciting, at what price this, may, this, this worked, um, and, and, and really just get their sort of, you know, kick the tires, uh, get their head under, uh, under the hood of the car, whatever the expression is. Um, but take them on a journey, let them understand and know the business, um, and get them as passionate as you feel about it, um, and sure, at the end of it, you know, you do have, you need often one or two investors to say, we're going to lead on this. Um, uh, Tessa was kind of brilliant in, 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 in herding a lot of cats at that point when we said, look, we need to do this now. We need to plan. We need to get the, the money in the bank account to be able to allow us to do that. Um, and we think we built a big enough relation or a strong enough relationship at that point that they feel strong enough vouching for you and taking those other actors on that journey. Um, and then once you start to get one or two over the line, there is definitely FOMO. There is kind of, okay, if they're doing it, then maybe we should as well. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that it, it's, it's kind of about balancing those relationships, working with them as a group, um, and then uh, uh, taking one or two to get uh, you over the line. And, and Tessa, what have you learned on the process of both, actually, in, in this very different funding pieces? There's a bit of FOMO there, there's a crowd here, revenue, like what would be your, I mean, None of them are done, or if, if ever, the regenerative journey is done. But what are your main lessons learned here? I mean, I think what w I was mentioning before about relationships is one of the key things. Ultimately, it's very hard not to be um, swayed by whether you simply just like someone, right? Whether you connect with them. And it's really hard to not bring that into a room, whether you have a warm introduction. Of course, that's... That's great. So I think ultimately, from like my perspective, the advice is get, have a lot of conversations and start very, very early before you even think you might even potentially need money. Because from kind of Mark's perspective, from eight it months- It was almost a bit late, yeah. No, not even, no. From eight nice, months in yeah. advance, he told me, you know, the hard cutoff is this time. And I'm like, thank you for not putting pressure on me and telling me you, we have two weeks because, you know, as investors, we like to say that we can move fast because we can because, you know, I'm very privileged that I work for a family office, which means that all the capital comes from one single place, which means we have much less uh, bureaucracy and reporting that's required in order to get an approval. You know, I can call up our principal and say, hey, we need to have this signed off within the next three days. You know, most people can't do that. And s but then at the same time, that doesn't actually happen in practice. You know, everyone's busy and having this long timeline and this lo and this opportunity to really get to know people meant that we actually could bring other people into the conversation and we didn't feel like we had to put pressure on any of them um, and we could still fulfill their needs. So I think, you know, having a lot of foresight is very, very vital when you think you might want capital at some point in your business. And at the same time, from my perspective, I, I like choice, but I don't want so much choice because you know we have so many businesses coming to us saying, we'll let you invest on whatever terms you want. And actually, you know, every single business is different. There's no denying that, but it's way, way, way more time consuming to come up with the terms myself um, or ourselves. You know, it takes a lot of work to think what model fits each business. And I don't know all the models out there. So, you know, if someone comes to me and says, this is the starting term sheet, that's great. I might say, absolutely not. And you might have to go back to the drawing board, but at least it's not drawing something up from scratch because when there's absolutely nothing there, it's not something that, I'm pr that we're personally gonna feel inclined to push forward quickly. Um, so, yeah. And actually, so to go back to Ruth, are you like different 
sources of capital, what Mark was saying, are you, I mean, of course, the crowd and, and this, this loan or revenue share, um, what other sources are you thinking about or using or have you considered as you're, I think, not going to stay with two shops? Like, how do you, maybe not hyper-franchise, that's a different world, but how do you use this funding to unlock the journey forward to four and, and hopefully ten at some point, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I mean, our, yeah, our vision is to create a local hub of stores in Sussex because it's all about scaling up the local suppliers. Um, so we Just to give a bit of background, like how much of the, I always love the statistic, yeah, I don't have it on the slide, like how much of the pound spent in your shop stays in the area and, and goes to the farmer compared yeah. to so the other big ones? Um, the, the big supermarkets, you spend a pound at the big supermarkets, 9 or 10p goes to the supplier, but at Hisby it's 67p. And we keep most of the money that comes to us local. So in a big supermarket, they keep only 5p in the local um, economy. They export and centralise money, and it has a very different impact on the whole supply chain if you're giving most of the money to the supplier and keeping it local. It's very fundamental, but it's actually revolutionary to do it the way we do it. Um, so it shouldn't be, <laughs> but it's it's Hence what's needed. Name, yeah, yeah it, 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 that's the name. So yeah, our um, our n we I mean we've done a mixture of grants and loans and um, s from social investors over the years. But our next big step would be to raise a couple of million, open two more stores, and create an operating model that can be replicated. So we're thinking of quite a sophisticated system that um, someone in another region could take to create a hub of Hisby stores there. You know, we could franchise elements of it, we could license elements of it, whatever it takes to have our concepts go nationwide. It doesn't matter exactly if it's a carbon copy Hisby store, it matters that people are using our principles. So we're thinking about how do we create an operating model. We need a couple of million to do that and resource it properly, and it makes sense now for us to um, go for a big equity raise. You know, get someone in, equity partners in, who can help us create that operating model, who can help us resource the business properly so it's not just me and Jack, because we're not going to achieve that on our own. And expertise, you know, we've had amazing mentorship through Be The Earth. We've got access to world-class retail experts, and that's what it's going to take. If we're going to really take on Tesco and create a replicatable model, that's what it's going to take. So, yeah, we need to turn the corner on where we are now and that the tide is turning post-COVID um, through the crowdfunder. Please look at the crowdfunder. Crowdfunder Hisby, you'll find it on Google. Um, and um, that's what it's going to take. Um, so, yeah, that'll be our next step is to go for a big equity raise with, with the right people. And we can also crowdfund part of that through someone like Ethex. So we might well crowdfund that so people can have a shot. We like it because it's democratic. You know, a group of people, whether you've got 50 quid or 50 grand, can own part of your business. We really like that concept. And, and for you, Mark, how does it this funding unlocks or will unlock, let's say, larger quantities of money? Because to, to really take on the wheat market, let's say, in, in, in the UK, you need a lot more, a lot more land, a lot more money. Like, what's the vision there in this um, almost developing development company? So um, I think fundamentally what that money has done is um, allow us to farm for two years, um, to develop and refine the model um, and demonstrate at scale that we have a regenerative, profitable model. At scale, meaning just Eight acres? So 800 hectares that we farm ourselves. Um, I don't have the numbers that wild farm source from as well. Um, but Significant scale. And yeah. successfully. Good yeah. harvest, good profitability, nothing to... Yeah, d successfully as in you can take those numbers in the future and look at other estates, look at other landowners, look at other financing sources and show this is working. Absolutely. So it's allowed us to prove that at scale both from the financial and operational side. Allowed us to feel comfortable with the P&L at the end of every year and say, you know, we put more or we put less money in the ground to generate more profit, um, and we do that with a more resilient and more robust system. Um, and, well, we have the financial data to support it as well. Um, and so that money that we raised has just allowed us to feel real confidence in the scalability of that model. Um, and so, and I'm talking about wild farming here, um, that then allows us to go out and have conversations um, with a variety of different actors about how we want to scale in the future. So one of those streams is uh, going out and providing management and advisory services 
to progressive estates who want to profitably transition to regenerative practices. We can now have those conversations, have the numbers to support us um, in those conversations and feel confident that when they transition, they can do so profitably. Because we're conscious that without this making sense at, a, at the bottom line, all of the environmental and all the ecological and all of the goodwill around that is, is, is irrelevant. It, it needs to work at a, at a bottom line level. Uh, and we now feel confident in our capacity to do that. Um, so we can have those conversations with, 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 with landowners, with estates, um, and we are doing that now. Um, for uh, Wild Farmed, let me say our sister company, um, it, uh, it allows them to go out and engage with farmers. Um, the, 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 the farming system that, that we refine on our farm that continues to be disseminated, and, and, and you know, those groups of farmers learn from one another across that um, group of farmers, um, it's not just us disseminating it out. Andy learns from all of the other farmers, there's 55 in the network, 60 possibly in the network, I think, that, 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 that everyone's learning from one another, but it allows us to have much more confidence in going and engaging with farmers. Um, and, uh, and broadly, what the, the goal of, I think, both entities is, um, is landscape renewal, right? Is taking brown, bare earth that's farmed as a monoculture and taking it into um, biodiverse arable fields um, and we want to scale that as quickly as possible um, because well ultimately there isn't a huge amount of time left 60 harvest 10 harvest whatever you hear um, it, 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 it's it, it, it we need to be able to do that imminently um, and wild farm supports that by by sourcing from as many farmers as possible so as I said 60 farmers and that allows each of those as landowners to to feel confident in their route to transition, knowing that they will get a premium offtake market. For wild farming, we do that by, as I said, partnering with landowners, but one of the additional sort of opportunities that we're exploring is potentially starting to invest in land ourselves over time. Which and means raising significant capital to buy land, yeah. Well, yes, it would, ultimately. Um, and But it, I guess this was about, with a sort of very finance hat on, I'm not a marketer, I'm not a farmer, it was about me sort of sitting down and thinking about what are the sort of large capital flows into farming um, and what is supporting conventional farming at the moment. Um, and that is in often cases, large pension funds, large institutional investors going out um, and uh, investing in farms and, and, and ultimately farming them conventionally, destroying the atmosphere, all of these negative things that we hear about it. And so it was us sort of sit sitting around and thinking, well, is there any way to rejig those incentives ultimately um, and get them excited about investing in regenerative agriculture? Can we structure those investments in a way that would generate the required return needed for... Um, for pensions, uh, for, 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 for real to reach the investors. hurdles to exactly. Uh, exactly. get them comfortable. I think that's the... And the truth is that y is, is yes, ultimately, uh, particularly having generated this data over the first couple of years, understanding exactly how profitable this system is, is that the the investment opportunity or the investment thesis that we could put forward to larger institutional investors, those that are aligned, sure, but others over time, I'm sure, is that we can invest in degraded land, you can rehabilitate and regenerate that land by farming or by you know operating in a regenerative way plus generating a strong cash yield over a long cycle um, gets to that mid to high single digits that a lot of these sort of pension fund investors want. Um, and that's that for us is sort of a really exciting sort of... Because just to add up in, in context, there's so much money in institutional investors. Absolutely. We're not that far from London, obviously, but like the amount, I think in these kind of rooms, we often forget how much money is managed by institutional players. And if we tap into that, that's mostly, I mean, the money in there going into ag is going into the extractive side. So what do we need to do to pull a percentage or a percentage point or whatever it is to pull into systems like we see here? And that's w as soon as that flow starts flowing, we get all the environmental benefits as well. And nice add-ons, maybe we'll get paid for that, which would be amazing. But if it, if it makes sense on the bottom line, some of that starts flowing very slowly probably because they need to see the three years the 10 years etc but you're confident like if we sit here in a year or two that we might have the first pension funds or insurance companies or large institutional investors 
starting to dip their toe into these kind of things? I mean, I think you're starting to see it already. Um, there are a number of asset managers um, also focused on regenerative agriculture that are starting to raise money from larger institutional investors that are excited or are able to, to get those investors excited about the returns that you can generate from regenerative agriculture. And I, I think it's important to say as well that the, the promise of regenerative agriculture is not just that it is ecologically and environmentally more sustainable. It's that it's financially more sustainable. You know, we want biodiversity because it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, because it's, it's great for our environment, but also it means you need, need less crop protection products. We want constant soil covering because uh, it, 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 it's good for, you know, building organic matter in the soil, but also it, 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 it makes you more robust to climate change. I mean, all of those elements that provide an ecological and environmental benefit also provide a financial one. And so it's about providing data points for all of these investors, um, including the pension funds, and helping them to realize that investing in, whether it's an SPV or a farm, however they want to invest. Special in purpose vehicle, just for them. But investing in, in, in those vehicles um, is a much more uh, financially stable and robust instrument for them to put their money to work. And so it's just about sort of thinking, taking a step back, thinking about the financial systems and thinking, okay, well, how can we catalyze that big institutional investment into supporting something positive? Speak the language, fix the data points and making sure it flows into these kind of things. I, I want to make sure we have time for questions and open it up as well. Um, we're going to do that with a floating mic who is in the back there. I forgot the name of the mic carrier. Um, hi, Christopher Mike. Ramsey at Pelican Ag. Hi, hi Kuhn. Um, so I, I suppose the first thing is I don't think we can understate how integral to the whole space Kuhn has been um, for raising awareness, at least within the investment community, for regenerative agriculture. <laughs> Very deserved. Um, and whether that's real asset investment or, or the venture space. Um, likewise, Be The Earth been there for many years now. Um, and it's, it's been really integral to growing this ecosystem. Wild I farms, love compliments, but where's the question? Well, so Wild Farms, we think probably are telling the story best. What we really need at the moment is we need everyone in this room to understand that this space really does need to be nurtured. It needs, it, there needs to be a crusade for more investment in the space. We're beginning to see big food, big ag look at it, but it's still early stages. And so I suppose my question is, how can we accelerate that? How can we tell better investor stories? And how can we progress? Who wants to take that? I can start. I think it's really scary, actually, when people start looking at things like, you know, mainstream starts looking at things like this because it just means there's, it's ripe for corruption. You know, now people look at the word sustainability and they hate it. You know, a couple of years ago, we started talking about regeneration and people already sa start, started saying, you know, that's not the word. You use this word that's poorly defined and people are just gonna take advantage of it. So I do think it's a huge responsibility for um, everyone really, but to take the stories and shout about them to the right people and to press people when they say they're doing impact investment that really isn't that impactful, because there's a lot of that, you know. Sure, the SDGs are great, I mean, they're absolutely better than nothing. Let's let you know. They're, it's amazing that people are talking about it. It's amazing that people are talking about ESG, you know, environmental, social governance. But that's not it. There's so much more than that. And you know, I was at a conference. I think it was last month, and someone asked a kind of similar question, but it was to someone in VC, and their response was, "Show me the winners, right?" But what they meant was the winner who's delivering them the financial returns first. And that, in my opinion, is not the answer. I think we need to have a much larger mindset shift around winners being the ones that, yeah, sure, financial sustainability, to use that word which I just said we don't like that much, but financial sustainability is important, but actually, you know, a winner is someone who's genuinely making impact in the work that they're doing. And, you know, that's why for us, it was really important to get to know these individuals who are starting the business and to understand, you know, the integrity behind the work that they're doing, their why that keeps them getting up every single day. And, you know, to see that they're not just driven by, you know, creating, generating more profit, because ultimately that's doesn't matter, 
you know, if the world ceases to exist, who cares? So I do, I agree. It's, it's, it's a huge question and it's vitally important to bring more money into the people creating real impact. But we have to be really, really careful around how we share that narrative and to ensure that we're not just talking about impact investment, but actually, you know, making a difference. And there's a piece on, on who do you tell the story to and what story you tell, because I think for institutional investors, also really understand what drives them. It might not even be the profitability, might, but might be the volatility. It might be the story they need to tell to pensioners. It might be that they have no idea what regeneration actually means or how a plant works. Like we also need to understand that most of the financial world lives in an office <laughs> and in a subway and in a taxi and in a home and has honestly no idea what a tree actually is. So also there, there is a lot of, no, it's, I, mean, I meet them every day. And it's like generally starting, not at, I'm not saying at a low point, but starting by understanding why ag and food is different than many other markets and really understanding what it means to regenerate, I think would be great to have many more here. Of course, we keep inviting them. They keep not showing up. Um, but to understand what actually how stuff grows helps a lot because that makes you understand that it's not a tech startup it's not WhatsApp, it's not et cetera. So there's a lot of lessons there, a lot of education needed, sorry. And unfortunately, many of the pioneers, like Chris and others, are doing that education, but not necessarily raising the money because the education one is not always the one that actually raises it. So I'm applauding all pioneers here in the room as well to educate everybody that is not deep in the space and to tell that story over and over again, even though you're not getting the euros or pounds or yen or whatever in, in return as investment. So but that's unfortunately the pioneer's curse, I think. There was a, a hand there. Oh, sorry. sorry, the mic is already here. Yeah, um, <coughs> great panel, great insights, thank you. Um, I work for an organization called FAIR, so we are an investor network. Um, so we do a lot of these education piece around regenerative agriculture, sustainable practices for investors so that they are more in tune with like what they need to do in terms of funding um, you know, these initiatives. My question was around the finance of uh, regenerative agriculture. So I'm assuming that you charge a premium on the products that you sell. So is that more from a transition point of view or is structurally region ag more expensive than conventional agriculture? Um, some products, well, it's difficult because comparing with the big supermarkets, the, the big supermarkets pricing structure is all already artificial because you know, you go into Sainsbury's and they have five different levels of sausages and the very cheapest ones are too cheap and the most expensive ones are hugely overpriced. But we offer sausages how they should be which exceed the quality and are about mid-priced. It's very difficult to explain price to the customer. So we talk about it being fair price. So when you spend 55p on a pint of milk in Morrison's, it, uh, the, the dairy farmer gets point of a pence. When you spend 55p on a pint of milk in Hisby, the dairy farmer gets 41p, and her cows get treated to, to the manner they become accustomed to, and she can afford to pay people the living wage, and we get um, milk from cow to f shelf within 12 hours. So it's difficult with price. Uh, but we, people understand the premium. They understand that some things like milk, uh, some things like meat are going to be more expensive and other things like vegetables are cheaper. You know, th they're sold loose, they come from down the road and it's, um, it's about the fairness of the prices that people are getting. Um, but ultimately, you know, people know that we're not Tesco they accept that there's overall going to be a premium and that what they're getting for that is much friendlier, better customer service, better quality of food, the feel-good factor that comes with supporting an organisation with ethics, um, and that all um, commands a premium. So, yeah, it's a funny question on price. <laughs> I hear getting out of commodities, like decommodification. Yeah, yeah. Uh, customer experience is important to people. You know, they come in and they, they experience something on our shop. We tend to do this thing where we employ people who like people. You know, <laughs> you go into the wow, store and that's a you get a reasonable, you know, people are generally happy to see you and they know your name and um, and people pay for that and they want that. So, you know, um, it's it brings, it brings people, it woos people away from Aldi who are, you know, two minutes down the road and into our store. And Mark, going from the artisanal bakeries to a big supermarket actually, or big players, is that of course, it's on a wild farm tie, but how like, is that difficult in terms of pricing? Or are you commanding that, or how does that work? Um, 
I, I guess I'll talk more from sort of a broader philosophical point of view. I'm not on the wild farm side and not involved in the conversations with the, the various supermarkets. But look, fundamentally, we know that the world doesn't need another £7.50 loaf of sourdough. That's not what we're going out there to do. We're going out there to drive systemic change. And that is only going to be possible if we can produce at a price or um, or sell at a price that is available for a larger group of, of, of across the socioeconomic spectrum. Now, having said that, food currently isn't paying its own bills. You know, we're not saying that we want a seven pound fifty loaf of sourdough, but at the same time, we're also saying that you know, fifty pence is arguably too cheap if you look at the impact that's having on health and supply chains, uh, environment, um, and. I guess we have this sort of internal motto in, uh, at Wild Farm in Wild Farm, which is, is the road to Greg's. Um, and Greg's, as many people know, is sort of a high street bakery. And that, um, that goal is about um, being able to produce at a scale and at a price that can make it available to as large a group of people as possible. Um, but having said that, always conscious that it, we need to be done, we need to produce in a way that focuses on soil health, on biodiversity. And costs. And, 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 and exactly, and doesn't in any way um, sacrifice on those elements. But in general, I mean, I like to use the example of Tesla, right? Tesla came out and it was 250,000 pounds. No one had one, or very few people. But over time, as you get operational scale, as you get operational efficiencies, technological improvements, that brings down that cost of production and that price. Um, and regenerative agriculture, in sure the system that we use and the variety of the farmers that, that, that source or that supply to wild farmed, they've only been at it for sort of five, 10 years. Conventional agriculture has had 75 years. So Which means you know, machinery, seeds, input, everything is exactly. hung to perfection and they're not making a lot of money anyway. So imagine 10 years, 15 years of this. Imagine 10, 15 years where you get these groups that are that are learning from one another every day, that are driving kind of all of these improvements, that are getting more efficient and better. Um, and yeah, ultimately that, that, that does give you or reduce over time that, that cost of production and allows it to be available to a broader group of people. Yeah, and it's not the first time I hear, I mean, it depends on the crops, I think as well. There are some very interesting crops where you can make an enormous impact without too much impact on the price and the costs are enormous because of input and you can drop it a lot. And I've heard people say, they don't see the yield gap too much. They would even be able to produce it without the premiums they can get for organic regenerative, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an, there are some, I'm not saying everywhere, but there are some where the cost piece, of course you have to look very carefully as an investor, an operator, an entrepreneur, but there are stacking models as well. There will be a panel tomorrow on profitability, by the way, all go. Um, and to s there are pieces there that are, even in the current economic system where we're not paying all the bills and are already profitable and, and able to pay the bills. And I think if we focus on that, and put all the money behind education, research, development, which the extract of ag had 80, 90, or in some cases 100, no, 12,000 years to perfect, we can get pretty far. Uh, yeah, I just want to add one thing. I think there's also a difficult element in that, um, from a farmer's perspective, sometimes that extra that you do make is the reason that they decide to convert, right? So that's definitely part of the equation. And I remember a couple of years ago at Groundswell, someone, I think they might have even been in this tent, but they were saying how, you know, one Christmas, uh, I think it was during COVID maybe, they just read everything that was online about how they could get government subsidies. And they basically realized they could make more by not producing food and actually just rewilding, right? They're like, I don't care about this, but now I do because it makes more money, right? So there's definitely an argument where if you want people to transition, you need to show them, oh, there's enough money there to make it worthwhile. Because there's no denying it's an investment. To transition your farm to regenerative, it takes time and it takes money, right? So you want to make more. So I think there's still a little bit, I don't have an answer at all, but just acknowledging there's definitely a gap in terms of, yes, we want to bring the price down for the consumers, but also as Ruth was saying, you know, we also have to bridge that gap so farmers are paid more, right? So that they're, you know, being it's being acknowledged that the work being put in to grow regeneratively farmed food is potentially more. I think we have time for one final question. Where, where's the mic? Already with Irv? Oh, mic is here, sorry. 
Go ahead, Abby. Uh, hi, Addie Windsor Clive from Regenerate Ventures. Thanks very much for a great panel talk. Um, just want to ask, like, obviously, getting more cash or sort of investment into this area has been you're looking at retail investors coming in through crowdfunding, and then for wild farming company, you're becoming more institutional as you raise more down the line. Is it going to be coming in from retail investors, rallying around from the people in this room, and sort of bringing around consumer awareness to this, or do you think it's going to the moving the dial is going to be coming from the big institutions, putting in the hundred to two hundred million pounds into sort of buying land? Where do you think it's, I mean, obviously it needs to come from both sides, but what do you think is going to be starting to move the dial first? Or how do we go about it? Uh, I think it's very complex, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I think there's a number of sources of capital that have to get excited about what is happening in the regenerative space. They have to get those data points, as I sort of mentioned. Um, uh, and, yeah, I, I mean... It, it, it's, it's just a combination of things. If I, if I go back to the sort of model on, on what drives that cost of production down, you talk about scale, right? And so you get scale in farming through a number of different ways, but you can get it through investing in land or you can get it from uh, sort of um, incentivizing current landowners to transition. Um, and so there'll definitely be some elements that's investing in land, larger capital, larger institutional investors. I think then you have to drive the technological improvements that you needed to make that as efficient as possible. So that's um, VC investors, ultimately, ag tech investors who can, uh, who can try and drive um, regenerative agriculture to be as efficient as possible. And then you have, let's say, brands that are able to communicate why that's important to, to, to consumers. Um, and as I say, sort of realize a premium throughout that, that, that supply chain, maybe sort of rejig some of those supply chains. Uh, and that investment is oft, uh, you know, often more sort of fast moving consumer goods VC. And so, yeah, ultimately it's a combination of different capital sources for me. Um, these are complex systems with um, a lot of different challenges, a lot of different financial flows. You need a lot of smarter people than I do sitting down and thinking about how those financial flows work and then trying to, to, to rejig them slightly so they can catalyze for, 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 um, for more positive outcomes. And I think in sort of, uh, sort of filling that gap at the moment is often aligned investors like Be The Earth, right? It, they are helping to sort of get uh, companies both from an operational point of view to a point where they can be invested in those in sort of larger institutional VC or capital, but also they're helping to sort of build um, that pool of data that makes it th those businesses investable. Yeah, let's not forget we're extremely early in this journey, not not in the regenerative journey. If you look at agroecology, etc., but the finance question there, we are just asking relatively recent, even though it feels like a long time. So it it is yeah, it's very very early. I want to. Erof had a question there in the hand before and I ignored it. And I think it's a final one. Looking at time? Yeah. So I have three minutes to go. Perfect. Yeah, but Irv is yeah. asking long so questions and difficult So I'll ones. make it I'll make it very quick, but um, on the on your question, can regen food be the same sort of price as conventional food? It doesn't need to be because it's so much better for the same price or a little bit more you get a huge amount more value more nutritional value. So it doesn't need to be the same price. It doesn't need to be dirt cheap. Um, but my question is, like, um, one of the problems I always see when I'm talking with VCs is that they always say, where's the technology? Where's this rapid scaling that you can, that you can get? So I've noticed that both of, both of the companies, the founders here, are both from the sort of the downstream sense where you're selling to customers when you're selling regen products to customers is that is that where you think the the, the opportunity lies and um you know what about the upstream to whom are me to whom are you asking uh well tessa but <laughs> obviously the other two will agree with that i imagine where where's the magic tech that <laughs> rose from a be the earth perspective we're less interested in tech reliant and I guess, or tech enabled. I mean, we're more interested in tech enabled in, in, rather than tech reliant, um, which is a little bit different to most investors. And for us, it's not necessarily um, a specific point in the supply chain that we're interested in, um, but we do want to see that there is a path to profitability, right? You know, a lot of people 
come to us and say, I'm raising this type of money, this is my plan, you know, if I can't look at it and say I agree with your hypothesis, then I can't reasonably say this is something that we can get behind. Look, like this is a disclaimer and I'm sad to say it, but we say no more than we say yes, right? And we're merely a drop in the ocean when it comes to capital. So really the questions you're all asking are so similar and it's kind of the whole point of this talk, which is that finance needs to be regenerative just like farming and food need to be regenerative, right? What we're trying to do is to encourage other types of, inve other types of investors, every type of investor to look at capital a little different to look at economies a little differently you know capitalism isn't necessarily the only way or the best way and at the moment it's really what takes precedence right but for from our perspective of course we have to say no and we set not necessarily artificial but we set boundaries to help us say no but other investors exclusively invest upstream exclusive a lot exclusively invest in technology because it has that kind of hockey stick exponential growth that they want to see. But really, all we're trying to do is encourage investors to look at, as I said before, returns in a different way. You know, what, whatever you're interested is in is great, but it doesn't need to be profit, 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 profit. How do you crush it to be, you know, the lowest input for the highest output? Because that actually just doesn't make any sense logically, you know, just the same way when a lot of people are, who are we're speaking today, I was like, wow, that's so obvious. Of course, if, you're, if your food eats healthy food, if what you eat eats healthy food, then you're gonna have more nutrition, right? It's the same thing. If you're gonna extract from a business, the business is not gonna do as well, you know? One person's gonna profit. Is that gonna be the best output for everyone? Absolutely not. So I think it's really just those same principles. I, I took a course earlier this year called Regenerative Economics, and people are starting to develop principles around that as well, which I think is so interesting because it is finance is such an important part of this, and we really need to shift money. Um, and you know, as they were saying, we're, so, we're a tiny investor. We're one person. You know, if people were to line up here, I wish I could say yes. You will throw money at all of you, but it just it doesn't work that way. These are two case studies of really you know of many, but if only we could show all the people that we aren't able to give money to, which is why the goal is ultimately to pull way more funders in to the same, yeah, to the story. So I hope that answered your question. I know it didn't entirely, but. I think it's a wrap. <laughs> We're on time. Thank you so much for giving your time to us before the beer. Thank you.